Hello everyone, my name is Sarison and I'm a third year medical student at Cardiff University. Today, I'm delighted to deliver to you a short presentation on motor neuron disease as part of the NANSIC educational series. This presentation is brought to you in collaboration between myself and Ioannis, who is the current network lead of NANSIC. So just a quick overview of the things we'll be covering today. We'll be looking at the background of motor neuron disease, the risk factors, the pathophysiology, so on and so forth, up to the current advancements in treatments. So before we go into the background of motor neuron diseases, I thought it would be good to show some well-known figures who have unfortunately been diagnosed with the disease. Examples being the radical physicist Stephen Hawking, Scottish rugby player Dori Weir, and English rugby player Rob Burrow. So what is motor neuron disease? Motor neuron disease, or otherwise known as MND, is a term used to describe a progressive neurological disorder that presents with both or either lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron signs. As a quick recap, lower motor neurons are the anterior horn cells that project from the brainstem and spinal cord to the muscles, and upper motor neurons are neurons that project to the brainstem and spinal cord from higher cortical centers. The mean age of onset of motor neuron diseases is 60 years old, with a lifetime prevalence of approximately 1 in 400. Of all motor neuron diseases, the most common type is called a myotrophic lateral sclerosis, with an incidence of 2 in 100,000 per year. One of the things I enjoy doing in medicine is breaking down the terms to what they mean to understand the pathology better. In the case of ALS, the word myotrophic comes from the Greek roots that mean without nourishment to muscles, and this refers to the loss of signals that nerve cells normally send to muscle cells. Lateral means to the side, and this refers to the location of the damage in the spinal cord. Sclerosis means hardened, and this refers to the hardened nature of the spinal cord in advanced ALS. MND is also known as Charcot's disease in honor of the first person to describe the disease, which is French neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot, and this was back in 1869. The disease became well known in the United States when baseball player Lou Gehrig was diagnosed with the disease in 1939. Hence, the name Lou Gehrig's disease is interchangeably used with ALS and Charcot's disease, and even MND as well, given that it's the most common motor neuron disease. A quick fact about the disease, Stephen Hawking was actually a rare case for he lived for decades. The average years of survival is two to three years from diagnosis, and some presentations have an even shorter prognosis, such as those with bubble respiratory presentations. Now, let's move on to the risk factors. Most cases of motor neuron disease have no known cause and are known as sporadic cases. However, both genetic and environmental factors are believed to be involved. The minority of cases have a genetic cause linked to a history of the disease in the family, and these are known as familial cases. The environmental factors often associated with MND are age, smoking, physical stress, and pesticides. Being a neurodegenerative disorder, MND gets more common as you get older, which is typical of all neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Research has shown that there are a variety of genetic factors associated with MND. The two most common genes involved are the SOD1 gene, which is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern, and the C9ORF72 gene, which is interestingly associated with frontotemporal dementia. There are a number of other genes involved as well, such as the TAR-DBP genes and the FUS genes. Now, coming on to the pathophysiology, this is understandably a very busy slide, but I will walk you through an overview of it. Um, what you should do is to look out for the red arrows, which I will use to indicate the molecular structures that I'm referring to. So the pathophysiological mechanisms that underline the development of neurodegeneration are multifactorial, with evidence of a complex interplay between genetic mutations and dysfunction of molecular processes. Cortical hyperexcitability, or in other words, glutamate excitotoxicity, seems to be an important final common pathway. However, clinician scientists remain unsure as to whether the same multiple factors exert a pathogenic role in all patients, or whether a particular mechanism 
predominates in a specific patient. On a molecular level, Glutamate-mediated excitotoxicity occurs due to the dysfunction of the astrocytic excitatory amino acid transporter 2, which is the EAA2 transporter, as shown by the arrow. And this results in a reduced uptake of glutamate from the synaptic cleft. Glutamate excitotoxicity leads to excessive activation of the ionotropic glutamate receptors, which are the NMDA and AMPA receptors, thereby inducing neurodegeneration via activation of calcium-dependent pathways and generation of free radicals. I would like you to keep in mind the NMDA receptor as I will later bring it up again when we arrive to the management of the disease. Superoxide dismutase 1, the SOD1 gene, um, its mutations are also associated with glutamate excitotoxicity and it also increases oxidative stress, induces mitochondrial dysfunction causes formation of intracellular SOD1 aggregates and adversely affect neurofilament and axonal transport. By contrast, mutations in the C9ORF72, the TAR-DBP proteins and the FUS genes are associated with dysregulation of RNA metabolism and formation of toxic intracellular aggregates. The activation of microglia results in secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines hence producing further toxicity within the neurons. Now, this slide is a bit less busy, and it aims to show the changes the disease brings at the cellular level instead. As we can see here on the right-hand side, essentially, over time, the motor neurons progressively damage and die, hence the muscles begin to undergo atrophy, and patients lose the ability to speak, eat, move, and even breathe. Now, coming to the clinical presentations of motor neuron diseases. So, as we've mentioned, a typical presentation, you would expect to see upper and or lower motor neuron signs. We've prepared a table for you here for um, the different signs that you can look out for um, when suspecting a patient with motor neuron disease. One interesting thing that I would like to highlight is that extraocular and sphincter muscles tend to be preserved in motor neuron disease as well as your senses. Unfortunately, if one is diagnosed with motor neuron disease, there is also a 10% risk of developing dementia. And lastly, one very classic sign I would like to point out is this thing called the split hand phenomenon, which occurs in ALS. And this is essentially preferential wasting of the tina muscles, the one just below the thumb, as opposed to the hypotina muscles just below your little finger. So what I've prepared over the next three slides are just um, differential diagnoses which you can consider when seeing patients with upper or lower motor neuron signs. So the first slide shows um, the differential diagnosis um, which you can consider um, for patients which has a mix of both upper and lower signs. So in this case, besides ALS, you can also consider compressive myeloradiculopathy or HIV infections. Coming on to the next part, where you have upper motor neuron signs purely, and the things you can consider are primary lateral sclerosis, multiple sclerosis, that's very common as well, um, hereditary, hereditary spastic paraplegia, and tropical diseases such as neurolatrism and conzo. So tropical diseases are quite interesting because these are diseases which come about um, when and they are caused by the ingestion of toxins from food products. So for example, um, ingesting cassava flour puts you at risk of getting conzo. And lastly, um, again, this slide looks a bit busy because there's quite a lot here, um, but it's just to give you a brief overview of things you should think about um, when seeing patients with just purely lower motor neuron signs. Um, there's also a lot of words here because among the things that I've also included is the inheritance pattern of the different subtypes of a particular disease. So for example, such as the proximal hereditary motor neuropathy, there's three different subtypes based on the age of onset. So the acute infantile form, the chronic childhood form, and even the adult onset form. Um, and one of the things I've also put here is the inheritance pattern, which in this case, all three of them are autosomal recessive. So coming on to the investigations, as we have mentioned, um, to investigate motor neuron disease, it's important to, 
identify that there's a combination of clinical signs and symptoms. And what you want to do when it comes to motor neuron disease is to be able to exclude any other possible diagnosis. Hence, it's important to choose the right investigations to perform, um, uh, to choose the right investigations to exclude other differential diagnoses. The investigations would normally include an MRI of the whole central nervous system, and this is to exclude cervical cord compression or, or myelopathy. Um, you would also like to consider investigating using nerve conduction studies to exclude any neuropathies, and you would also consider um, electromyography, um, which in the case of MND, it, it tends to show action potentials with an increased amplitude as compared to normal action potentials. So coming on to the diagnosis, um, again, when it comes to motor neuron disease, there are things which you would want to find and things which you want to exclude. So what we have put here is the presence of positive criteria. So things that you want to see are, is that the patients have lower motor neuron signs and or upper motor neuron signs. And you also want to make sure that there's a progression of the signs and symptoms over a period of time. You would also want to check that there's an absence of these signs, such as sensory signs, sphincter disturbances, visual disturbances, so on and so forth. And lastly, to support the diagnosis of motor neuron disease, you would want to look for things such as fasciculations in one or more regions. You would also expect to see positive sharp waves, sharp waves in your EMG results. And you would also expect to have normal motor and sensory nerve conductions. So coming on to the management part, um, as what we normally do in medicine, we always try and break it down into the non-pharmacological and uh, non-pharmacological medical interventions, as well as the pharmacological and medical interventions, and sometimes surgical interventions as well. In this case, um, what's important to note, the first thing is to know that we want to be able to offer patients the psychosocial support that they need um, when dealing with their condition, especially for conditions such as motor neuron disease. Hence, it's important to recognize the role of MND nurses in providing the psychological and practical support to these patients. Next, in terms of treatment of MND itself, Rilozole is the drug that we, see, that we use, and it is mainly used in ALS patients. However, it is thought to slow progression at best by 10%. Going back to the NMDA receptor I told you to keep in mind, yes, Rilozole is an NMDA receptor antagonist, hence it blocks the receptor. Other things that we offer to patients um, are things for symptom control, such as to make sure that the patients are well nourished and to make sure that they're given the right support to breathe. For nutrition in particular, you would want to consider early gastrostomy insertion for patients which are likely to develop swallowing difficulties. So coming to the last slide of our presentation today, we are going to discuss current advancements. So we recently came across a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, which was a study conducted by Mueller and his team. They trialed a potential treatment plan on two ALS patients with SOD1 mutations. The team interestingly delivered a single intratical infusion of viruses encoding microRNA that aims to target and destroy the SOD1 proteins accumulated in the neurons. The outcomes showed that the patients remained stable throughout the 12-month follow-up with some improvement in muscle function. However, the stability observed could be due to slow progression of the disease itself. Therefore, it is important for future studies to determine the results of this method in a larger number of patients who have ALS with, um, in, who have ALS with SOD1 mutations. So that comes to the end of my presentation, and these are the references for those of you who are interested to look up more into the things that we've presented today. And one of the things I'd like to do is to dedicate this lecture in loving memory of Ioannis Kepriano, who is the grandfather of Ioannis Georgiou. And I would like to thank um, Ioannis and Dr. John Reed for their support um, in the preparation and production of this presentation. And lastly, what I would hope for everyone here to do is to support ALS patients. Um, as you can see here, one of the pictures that I've uh, put up on the slide here 
is the Ice Bucket Challenge, which was a viral challenge on social media back in 2014. Uh, nope, so I'm not here to restart that challenge. Uh, but instead, um, I would like you to consider donating to the Motor Neuron Disease Association um, to support research for motor neuron diseases and to advocate for those affected by motor neuron disease to live their lives to the fullest. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much.